Open your Bibles this morning, Revelation chapter 5. Also put something in Ezekiel chapter 21. And also put something in the 69, Psalm 69. And let me make one arrangement here. Okay. It's Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, of the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and in the four beasts, uh, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne, upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of orders, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to, to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to the to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth and I beheld and I heard a vo the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power to be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Last time we were together, we went through the Revelation chapter 4, the whole chapter, and we were introduced to a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. And that throne sets the tone for the rest of the book of the Revelation because everything that happens throughout the rest of the book happens as a result of the orders and the commands and the instructions that are given from the throne or from the command center or from headquarters as we called it. Now, Revelation chapters 4 and 5 are really one unit. In these two chapters, we're introduced to two very important things. In chapter 4, we're introduced to the throne. In chapter 5, we're introduced to a book. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Now there's much speculation about this book, what the book is, even who it belongs to. Uh, notice, well, I'll get to that in a minute. But if you remember a while back, I preached a message in Revelation chapter 20 entitled, And the Books Were Opened. And we showed that at the great white throne, the books of the law, the books of Moses, will be opened to those who lived under the law. 
And then Paul's epistles will be open to those who did not trust Jesus Christ as their Savior today. Paul's epistles will be opened, and they will be judged according to those things which are written in, in those epistles. And then Hebrews to Revelation will be open to those people who go through the tribulation period and reject God's remedy for them. And the Bible said that, and they were judged out of those things which are written in the books. But none of those books are this book in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1. This is another book. Some people say that this book is actually the book of the Revelation. I don't agree with that. And I'm going to tell you why. Because in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, it says that this book was sealed with seven seals. Well, the book of Revelation is not sealed. It's not sealed with seven seals. It's open in front of you right this second. So I said to myself, I wonder where the first mention of the word seals is in the Bible. So I did a search, and I found that the very first time the word seals is used in the Bible is in this verse right here. So that didn't help at all. <laughs> okay. So I did another search. I looked up the word sealed, and that yielded some fruit. Because we want to know who this book belongs to. So in 1 Kings chapter eight, uh, 21 and verse 8, this is about Jezebel and Ahab. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. So notice that she wrote letters in Ahab's name, in his name name and sealed it with his seal so I, now I know one thing for sure about something that is sealed it belongs to someone specifically to a specific person and then I looked over further in the in your King James Bible in Esther chapter 8 verse 8 write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring for the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring no man may reverse it now I know something else about a seal when it's written in the king's name and sealed with the king's seal no man will reverse it so the sealed book in Revelation chapter 1, belongs to someone specific, and because it's sealed, we know that no one can reverse it. So the important question is, who does the book belong to? Well, notice in Revelation chapter 5, now this is speaking of the Lamb, the Lamb himself, coming and doing this in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Now I know something else. I know the book belongs to the one who's sitting on the throne because he's holding it in his right hand. And whether you knew this or not, God is right-handed. Isaiah says that he will do certain things with the right hand of his righteousness. When it talks about God doing something with his right hand, Never says God did it with his left hand. Never. So the book belongs to him that sat on the throne. Now before we speak of the qualifications of the one who came and took the book out of the right hand, because somebody came and did that. They didn't ask for it. They weren't given the book. They took the book as though someone with authority, as though someone who had the right to do it, did it. I want to try to understand what the book is, what it is, and why it's important. So let me develop this theme. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. 
Remember, if you remember last week, we read in Ezekiel chapter 28 about Lucifer being the most beautiful creation that God had ever created. He was the, the covering cherub. In him were all the tabrets. He was the leader of, the, of all the music in heaven. He was, he was glorious. He was God's first king in creation. He controlled everything. And then one day he was filled with pride and said, I will be like him, like the most high God. So he was cast out of heaven. And after he was cast out of heaven, God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And about Adam, Adam is God's second king. Because in, in Genesis, uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible said, Thou hast made him self. Go hit the first light switch, please. The one far left. Thank you. There. I can see. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 7. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands. So this verse says that God crowned Adam. Who wears a crown? The king wears a crown. So Adam was God's second king. And then God gave him dominion and made him Lord over all the works of his hands. The heavens, the earth, he named everything. We also read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. You can't miss the word over and over and over. God made Adam over. And then in verse 28, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, notice, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth so Adam was the Lord of creation he was God's second king Satan came along and deceived Eve and usurped the authority and dominion and the crown back from Adam and he reclaimed his title as the king and became the God of this world as you know him today and we know that he owned the world because when he, when Jesus Christ was led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil 40 days and 40 nights, this is what the devil said to him, to Jesus Christ. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that, all that power and all that glory, that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. Satan usurped the power from Adam, and because he did, legally, that power and that dominion and that glory was transferred to him. Legally. That's why we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. If Satan is the God of this world, doesn't that explain why the world is the way it is today? People who don't understand what I just said think that God is controlling everything in the world today. If God is controlling everything in the world today, he doesn't know how to drive. I mean, look at all the forest fires right now. 
the flooding, earthquakes, murdering, people killing themselves. You really think God is controlling that? In whom the God of this world, Satan is the God of this world right now. But there's a day coming, and we're, look, we're going to look at this right now. The point, though, of everything that I just shared with you is that Satan, being the God of this world, and now he owns it, has brought the chaos that you and I see every single day. But there's one problem with him owning it, and it's this. God owns the title deed to the universe. That's the book in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1. It's the title deed to the universe. So what we're about to see in the book of the Revelation right now as we go through this is a reversal of the way things have been. It's a taking back of the ownership. It's a changing of the guards. You're going to see it happening right before your eyes. Notice, though, John sees a problem at first. Before this happened, John sees a problem. What is it? Verse 2, Revelation 5, 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. There's a pro John has a problem first here. Because over the centuries, many have been willing to take the book and to take government of the world. Many have tried. Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, Napoleon, Hitler, they all tried. But the question is not who is willing. The question asked is who is worthy. That's the question. Notice in verse 3, John says, And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Now there's three places mentioned here. The first one is heaven. Well, at the time of this writing, who's in heaven? John. Who else? God, Jesus, the angels, and the body of Christ that has been raptured out of here is already there. And not one member of the body of Christ is worthy. Not even the Apostle Paul is worthy to open the book. But it says also, nor on earth. What does that mean? It means not the president. Should I say, especially not the president. Nor the philosophers nor the diplomats, nor priests, nor popes, nor rabbis, nor Sister Teresa, nor anyone was worthy. But notice it also says, neither under the earth. Who's that? It's those that are awaiting the resurrection from Adam, from Adam, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jonah, Obadiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, the 12 apostles. They're, waiting the re they're, in, they're under the earth. They're waiting the resurrection. Those today in the dispensation of grace, those in the dispensation of grace that are not going to be caught up at the rapture, they're under the earth. They're waiting. John says, no one, no one, not Abraham, not Isaac, 
not Jacob, no one under the earth, not the fallen angels, no one, not one person was able to stand up and say, Lord, here I am. I'm worthy to open the book. I'm worthy to take control of the universe. Not one. Of all the billions of people that have been born, not one has lived a life worthy to take the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. How true all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Notice in verse 4, Revelation 5, 4, says, And I wept much. You know, John's reaction to this is shocking because he's probably thinking to himself, at this point, there's no one in heaven, there's no one on earth, there's no one under the earth who's worthy to open this book to reclaim the earth. And he's probably thinking to himself, are we doomed to be forever under the control of Satan's chaos? Is that our destiny? Notice verse 4, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read neither to look thereon. Now I ask you to mark Ezekiel chapter 21, Ezekiel chapter 21, and Psalm 69. Because I want to read to you two passages of Scripture from the Old Testament that explain to us what's happening right here, right now, in Revelation chapter 5, at this moment, when this happens, I want to show you what's happening right here. In Ezekiel chapter 21, I'm going to put them up here as we go. Ezekiel 21, verse 25. And thou, profane, wicked prince of Israel, that's the Antichrist, whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end. You see, there's a day when his reign of iniquity is over. It just started. It's starting right now in Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to show you that. Okay? But here's the prophecy of it. Here's the prophetic scripture of it. Verse 26, thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem. That's ta he's talking to the profane, wicked prince of Israel. The diadem is on his head. On the front of the crown, really, the diadem is on the front of the crown and then the crown. He says, remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. It's not going to be the same anymore. Things are about to change. Exalt him that is low, that's Israel. Abase him that is high, put down the Antichrist. Verse 27, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. What? Overturn the throne of dominion. Overturn, overturn the one who's in charge. There's a changing of the guards here. And it shall be no more. What? What no more? The reign of Satan, the God of this world, shall be no more. How long? Until he come whose right it is and I will give it him. That's happening right here in Revelation chapter 5. The one whose right it is, the one that John is about to see, as we go back there, the one that John is about to see has come. The one whose right it is. And thou, son of man, verse 28, prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord God concerning the Ammonites, and concerning their reproach, even say thou, the sword, the sword is drawn for the slaughter. That's what's in the book of the Revelation, the sword. Okay? He's, when he returns, there's a sharp two-edged sword out of his mouth. It is furbished to consume because of the glittering. 
You know what that, the glittering is? It me, actually means the glittering. Remember the land of Shinar and all the gold and all the merchandise and all the silver and all the delicacies, all the glittering? That belongs to the Antichrist. Verse 29, while they see vanity unto thee, while they see vanity unto thee, whiles they divine a lie unto thee, to bring thee upon the necks of them that are slain, of the wicked whose, whose day is come, when their iniquity shall have an end. Verse 30, shall I cause it to return into his sheath, and I will judge thee in the place where thou wast created, in the land of thy nativity. You know where that is? The land of Shinar. Antichrist, not from Jerusalem. The land of Shinar. This is talking about destruction, not of Jesus Christ and where he was, the Antichrist, where he's from. The land of Shinar. And I will pour out my indignation upon thee. I will blow against thee in the fire of my wrath and deliver thee into the hand of the brutish men and, to, and skillful to destroy. Thou shalt be for fuel for the fire. That's where he's headed to the lake of fire. Thy blood shall be in the midst of the land, and thou shalt be no more remembered, for I the Lord have spoken it. That's in Revelation chapter 5, the, the one who's right it is, we're about to look at him. But then the ensuing things that happen after this begins, because the tribulation begins in chapter 6. That's when it begins. Right now we're being introduced to all the players. We were introduced first to the players on the other end in Revelation 17, Mystery Babylon. Now I'm introducing you to the players on the other side moving forward. There's another verse I wanted you, you to see is Psalm 69. Psalm 69. This is a psalm about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ when he died for the sins of men. But it includes some information about what he was accomplishing at the same time. So notice the first three verses are actually Jesus Christ on the cross. Verse 1, save me, save me, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. Remember he said, I thirst on the cross. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me being mine enemies wrongfully are mighty. That's Jesus Christ on the cross dying. Notice the last words of that verse. Then I restored that which I took not away. Jesus Christ is going to restore what he did not take away from Adam. Satan took away from Adam the crown and the dominion and the glory. Jesus Christ is going to restore that. And in Revelation chapter 5, we see that happening. I mean, there was a day when Jesus Christ would have restored what was stolen by Satan. Remember this? I mean, back here, Adam lost. Adam lost the kingdom. The kingdom was supposed to be established already through Adam. Adam had the dominion. He had the authority. So God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and created the nation of Israel. The rest of the Gentiles stayed down here. That was all the Gentiles. The Jews moved forward in history. And God had kings, many kings throughout Israel. All of them failed, but many kings for the purpose of establishing a kingdom. But they were all disobedient, and God got rid of them one after another. Finally, Jesus Christ arrives. He's introduced by John the Baptist. And Jesus Christ comes on the scene, and John the Baptist says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and there's the king. And the king has come to set up this millennial kingdom out here. But the prophecy of Daniel's 70th week is still in full force. That was prophesied back here, Daniel's 70th week. That's punishment on Israel 
for rejecting their Messiah and purging out the dross out of Israel so that these people can go into the kingdom of pure people and then come back and bless the nations, the Gentiles, like they said they were going to do. Well, when he came unto his own, his own received him not. They took him and they put him on a cross and they killed him. On the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he gave them a one-year extension of mercy. And for one year, the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ went forth with signs, wonders, and miracles, trying to prove to Israel that Jesus Christ, the one they had crucified, was their Messiah. And he was trying to get them to repent so that he could establish his kingdom. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen's last appeal, exactly one year after the cross, Stephen's appeal to get them to repent. And rather than repent, they stoned Stephen. And it was there that God saved Saul of Tarsus and gave him the revelation of a secret that had been hidden God for ages and generations. And Paul says that the things that he knows are things that, were, that in other ages were not made known. And God gave Paul Romans to Philemon and introduced the agency of the body of Christ, which has a heavenly inheritance, and one day the rapture is going to happen. And Jesus Christ is going to resume his prophetic dealings with Israel right where it stopped, right here. And right now, what we're reading in Revelation 5 is right here at the beginning of the tribulation period. Where now prophecy is going to be resumed after, after the rapture of the church, the body of Christ. So Jesus Christ here was ready to restore that which he had not taken away. He was ready to restore. That's what he was going to do. But they killed him. Rather than receive him as their king, they killed him in total rebellion against God. And he still extended one year of mercy to them. But they rejected him again in rebellion and hardened their hearts. And God introduced a secret through the Apostle Paul. Then this is where we are today. And that's why Romans to Philemon, that's your doctrine. That's your epistles. That's how you grow. See? But now in Revelation chapter 5, we see the one whose right it is to do what? He came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. But I want you to notice how this section begins. And what qualifies him to take the book out of the hand of him that sat on the throne? Notice again verse 4, And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold. In other words, stop, John. That's Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. Stop, John, he says. Don't weep. You missed something. John. He had been so caught up with all of the events that he was looking at from Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. That's all one thing happening at one time. There's, you know, there, just because there's a chapter 5 there doesn't put a pause. It's all happening at one time. And John's been so, so caught up with the throne and the rainbow like emerald and the cherub and the angels and the sea of glass and the lightnings and the thunderings. He was so caught up with all that, that he missed the most important person that was right there standing in the midst. He said, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four elders, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And John finally gets a glimpse of the most important person standing in the midst of the throne. Now in these verses, he has three titles. Each of these titles points to a character quality that enables Jesus Christ to take the title deed of the universe out of the hand of him that sat upon the throne. In these verses, he's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's called the Root of David. 
and he's called the lamb as it had been slain. And there is a function associated with each of these names. The question could be asked, what is the basis of your claim to the title deed of earth? What qualifies you, Jesus Christ, to take the title deed out of the hand of God and open that book? What qualifies you to do that? And his answer would be threefold. As the lion of the tribe of Judah, he would say, the world and the universe is mine by conquest. I will win it back by war. The second is the world is mine by creation. I created it. And as the root of David, I am the rightful heir to the universe. And the world is mine by way of the cross. I redeemed it. I purchased it with my own blood. Now, in Genesis 49 and verse 9, talking about this lion of the tribe of Judah, says Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. That's Jesus Christ. Peace. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The gathering of the people is the gathering of Israel under his headship in the millennial reign of Christ when prophecy is completely fulfilled. So the rightful heir of the throne, as a matter of fact, Matthew opens his gospel, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, says that the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus Christ is the son of David. He's the root of David. He's the rightful heir to the throne of David. That's what was promised back here. That's what was promised, that David would have a throne. And he came here to establish that throne, but they killed him. He gave them a one-year extension of mercy. They stoned Stephen. So he cut off Israel, saved Saul of Tarsus, entered the dispensation of grace. That's where we are today. Matter of fact, we're right here today. We're right next to the rapture. It could happen any time now. We're, I think we're close. I don't know how close. But we're close. And when this happens... The rightful heir, the son of David, of the root of David, has arrived on the scene. And John the Baptist introduces him as that. So as the root of David, he's the rightful heir. As the lion, he wins the world by conquest. As the, as the root of David, he's the rightful heir. But in Revelation 5, 6, he's also the lamb. And as the lamb, he has the right to the title deed because he paid for it. Satan did not pay for it. He usurped it. He got it by trickery. He got it by deception. Jesus Christ is getting it back by conquest by his blood and by the right of creation. And Revelation 5, 7 said, And when he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that he sat on the throne, and when he did that, notice in verse 8, Revelation 5, 8, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign with him, and we shall reign on the earth. So the beasts and the 24 elders 
worship him because he's qualified to open the book. Notice verse 11. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That's all the angels in the universe. Innumerable number. Uncountable number. Verse 12, all those angels saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. But that's not all that worship him. Notice verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever. In other words, when he went and took the book out of the hand of him that sat on the throne, and they recognized that he was the root of the line, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, and the lamb that was slain, then they began to worship him in unison. Every corner of the universe is represented in all these people who worship when they realize who had took the book out of the hand. From the farthest reaches of the third heaven to the farthest, darkest, loneliest, darkest places of hell, his rejectors still have to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. They all had to do it. He will be the focal center of praise from every avenue in the universe by all the angels, by all the redeemed of all ages, and he will even be praised at the furthest extremes in the other direction by every damned and outcast soul that ever rejected Jesus Christ. It's in this place and it's at this time that Philippians chapter 2 comes into play. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus Every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in the earth, and things under the earth. See it happening in Revelation when they realize who he is? And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When Jesus Christ takes the deed, the title deed of the universe, out of the hand of him that sitteth upon the throne, Every knee will bow and every tongue in heaven, on earth, and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And like I've said to people before since I've been saved, 28 years, I've told many people that during my Christian journey, I've told them that you can bow now or you can bow later, but you're going to bow. You will bow. No one is escaping that. Ever. During the, I believe, the 1939 Olympics, when the, 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 the parade that begins the whole thing was in the stadium. I forget the name of the stadium. I was going to look it up last night. I forgot. But every nation represented, went in review before Chancellor Hitler, all bearing the flags of their country. And when they would pass before Hitler, every flag would bow before him. And finally came time for the, the United States of America to come before Hitler, and the flag remained pointed straight in the sky, and they said, the American flag 
bows to no man. But every knee will bow to Jesus Christ. Every knee will bow. There is no escape of that. You can rest assured of that. So if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you have not trusted in the finished work of Calvary for your redemption and for your eternal salvation, today would be a good day for you because you can bow now or you can bow later, but you're going to bow. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I pray that anyone listening to this would know the, the veracity, the importance of a message like this that just presents that the rightful heir to the throne has just been revealed. The one whose right it is was promised that when he, was, he came, that it would be given unto him. And we have just seen that happening. And I pray that today, while it's still time, that no one would say, oh, I'll just go to hell where all my friends are. I'll just go have fun with them. Or I don't believe. Because none of those excuses are valid. Because the reality is, whether you believe it or not, one day you will bow to Jesus Christ. And I would rather bow, having accepted him as my Lord and Savior, than bow as one of his rejectors. So I pray that no one will make that fatal mistake today and reject Jesus Christ as their Savior. I pray these things today in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ.